Some of you may have noticed that I wasn't here last Sunday. I wanted to be, but I couldn't figure out how to get back from a Saturday night wedding in the farthest corner of South Carolina in time to be here in Richmond on Sunday morning. And I couldn't figure out how to get to a Friday night wedding rehearsal without spending all day on Friday driving to South Carolina. So as a result, I ended up spending a couple of nights in a hotel room that had cable television. And since I don't have cable at home, I spent a good five or six minutes watching it. <clears throat> it was wonderful. Maybe some of you have done this before, where you sit in front of the television set with a remote control and you surf through the channels, stopping every once in a while to listen to the dialogue and decide whether or not you want to stay there or move on to the next channel. Usually it doesn't take too long to make a decision. You move on to the next one. But every once in a while, something will stop you in your tracks. You will hold the remote in your hand, waiting to see what happens next. Why did that woman say what she said? Why did that man do what he did? You can't wait to find out the rest of the story. Which makes me think that if the Gospel of Matthew were a television show, there is one line from today's reading that would stop me in my tracks that would make me want to know more. I would pause with the remote control in hand to see why that man on the screen said to those people who were listening, tax collectors and prostitutes will go into the kingdom of God before you. Even if I didn't know who Jesus was, or, or what the kingdom of God was, or who the chief priests and elders were, I would want to know what made that man say what he said to those people. So let's pause for a moment on this passage of Scripture from Matthew 21 and maybe even back up a few chapters to find out what's going on here. In fact, let's go all the way back to chapter 19 because something happens there that may inform the rest of the sermon. It's in verse 13 where Matthew says that people were bringing children to Jesus in order that he might lay his hands on them and pray for them. The disciples are shooing those people away, telling them the master is too busy, he doesn't have time for you, but Jesus stops them and says, the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, these children. Now hold those words in your head for a moment. Because in the very next paragraph, a rich young man comes to Jesus asking what he must do to have eternal life. We get confused about these things sometimes, don't we? E eternal life, heaven, kingdom of heaven, aren't those all just different ways of saying the same thing? Well, maybe they are and maybe they aren't, but they all sound like good things, don't they? The kind of things you would want to have. This man wants to have some of that. What must I do, he says, to have eternal life? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. But this man says, which ones? And Jesus mentions a few commandments apparently at random. Let's see, don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Uh, don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Honor your father and mother. Oh, yes, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the man says, I've kept all of these. What more must I do? And Jesus stops and says, well, if you want to be perfect, then go and sell everything you have. Give the money to the poor. Come and follow me. And the man couldn't do it. He was possessed by his possessions. And that's when Jesus says it's going to be hard for rich people to enter the kingdom. And I think what he means by that is rich people haven't had much experience asking for things. They've often been able to provide for their needs. When they're hungry, they go out to a nice restaurant. When they're sick, they go to the doctor or the pharmacy. 
It's not like that with poor people. When they're hungry, they might have to beg for food. When they're sick, they might have to say a prayer. I told someone just recently that if you cannot ask for help, you cannot be saved because we cannot save ourselves. We need help, the kind of help that only God can give, and if we can't ask for it, we can't receive it. See, poor people are good at this. They've had to ask. They know how to do it. Rich people, not so much. It's going to be hard for them, Jesus says, people who don't know how to ask for what they need. And Peter says, what about us? We, we gave up everything to follow you, Master. And Jesus says, yes, you did, and you will get everything back and a whole lot more. But I tell you, when the kingdom comes, some of those who are last will be first, some who are first will be last. And then he tells a story to illustrate that truth. It's the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, one we have had trouble with ever since Jesus first told it. Because at the end of that story, the ones who worked only an hour get just as much as the ones who worked all day. It doesn't seem fair to us. We want to know what's the point of doing all the work if in the end you get the same amount. But listen, the owner of this vineyard doesn't pay people on the basis of what they deserve, apparently, but rather on the basis of what they need. And everybody needs enough to live on. In fact, the only ones who are in trouble at the end of this story are the ones who are not satisfied because they didn't get as much as they thought they would get. And the master says to them, why are you upset? Didn't I promise to pay you a day's wage? Didn't you get what I promised? Or are you jealous because I'm generous? Am I not allowed to do what I want with what belongs to me? Go back to the story of Jesus blessing the little children for a minute. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. These children, those who haven't done one thing to deserve it, it belongs to them. Why? Maybe because they know they can't earn it on their own, that all they can do is hold out their hands. Maybe because they know they belong to the Father, and the kingdom of heaven belongs to Him, and whatever is His is theirs. It reminds me of how it was when I was growing up. My father would give out work assignments to my brothers and me in the summer. Mom would cook a big breakfast. We would all stumble down the stairs, sit around the table, and while we were eating, Dad would lay out the assignments. Ed and Scott, I want you to do this. Jim, you can go hoe corn in the garden, Greg and Gray. You can muck out the stalls in the barn. We would work up until about noon and then have the afternoon off, and Dad would go off to his work. When we gathered around that same table for supper, my father didn't dole out the food on the basis of how much work we had done. It didn't matter that some worked harder than others. We all got enough to eat. And when it was time for bed, we all had a place to sleep. We were living in my father's house. Everything he had was ours. We didn't lack for anything. I believe that's how Jesus thought about the heavenly Father. He wasn't going to give more to some on the basis of how hard they had worked or how good they had been. He was going to make sure that everybody had enough. And so when Jesus came into Jerusalem, and especially when he went into the temple, he was appalled to see that the religious leaders of Jerusalem had turned this beautiful relationship with God into a religion of requirements and rewards. The ones who had been the best or done the most were getting more. And Jesus began to turn over tables, and he chased out the money changers and turned over the seats of those who were selling doves it's almost as if he hung a sign above the temple that said, this place is under new management. My father's house is meant to be a house of prayer, he said. You have turned it into a den of robbers. 
And when things settled down, he began to open the eyes of the blind and heal those who were crippled. And the little children in the temple precincts began to sing, Hosanna to the Son of David. There they are again, those children, the ones to whom the kingdom of heaven belongs. They seem to be able to see what is really going on even when others can't. The chief priests and scribes, for example, when they saw what Jesus was doing, they were angry. In the Greek text it says, when they saw the wonderful things he was doing, they became angry. Can you believe that? Can you imagine how it must have made Jesus feel? He left the temple at the end of that day, went out to Bethany to spend the night, and I imagine it was a restless night that he tossed and turned, thinking about those religious leaders in the temple. And when he came back to Jerusalem the next morning, he was still thinking about it. He saw a fig tree by the side of the road, and he went looking for figs, but he found no fruit, only leaves. And I think it reminded him of those religious leaders. No fruit, all leaves. And so he said to that tree, may you never bear fruit again. And in that moment, Matthew says, the tree was withered to its roots. It was an act of judgment, wasn't it? On that kind of fruitlessness. And then Jesus went to the temple and began to teach. And the chief priest and elders saw him. They came running up because they had had a restless night as well. Who gave you the authority to do this? They wanted to know. Who told you you could come into our temple and do all these things? And Jesus said, let me ask you a question. The baptism of John, did it come from heaven or from earth? Was it ordained by God or by man? Answer me that and I'll answer you. And they began to argue among themselves and finally agreed, if we say it came from God, he will say, why didn't you believe him? And if we say it came from men, he will say, well, the crowds will say, away with you, because they all think of John as a prophet. And so they said to Jesus, we don't know. And he said, well, then I'm not telling you either where my authority comes from. But I will tell you this. There was a man who had two sons. He went to one and said, go work in the vineyard today. And he said, no, thank you. I've got other things to do. But later changed his mind and went. He went to his second son and said, go work in the vineyard today. And he said, oh, yes, sir, right away, sir. But he didn't go. Which of these two did the will of his father? And even the chief priest and elders had to agree it was the first son, the one who did what his father asked. I hadn't made this connection before, but there seemed to be some similarities between what John the Baptist was doing and what Jesus was doing. John was cleansing the people of Israel, getting them scrubbed up and ready for the kingdom that was coming. Jesus was cleansing the temple, getting it scrubbed up and ready for the same thing. Both of them were operating under divine authority in a way that made all other authorities anxious. They didn't want new management. They were happy managing things themselves. Who told you you could do this? They wanted to know. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. Even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. See, the tax collectors and prostitutes didn't want to have anything to do with God or his kingdom until John the Baptist told them that the kingdom of God was coming near, and then they did something. They repented of their sins. They got baptized. But the chief priests and elders were like that second son. They said, oh, yes, the kingdom. We are all about the kingdom. But when John said it was coming near, they didn't lift a finger 
didn't get baptized, didn't repent, didn't do anything. Maybe they thought they were already as righteous as they needed to be. I tell you the truth, Jesus says. Many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first. Tax collectors and prostitutes will go into the kingdom ahead of you. It is a word of judgment, isn't it? Makes us all sit up a little straighter and wonder where we will end up. But notice this. In that parable about the laborers in the vineyard, everybody gets paid. The ones who worked all day and the ones who worked only an hour. And when Jesus says to the chief priests and elders, listen, the tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you, he doesn't say, instead of you. Everybody gets in. Everybody gets paid. There is a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. It takes in people we probably wouldn't take in. Tax collectors, prostitutes, chief priests, and elders. It reminds us that we are all God's children, and it isn't His will that even one of us should perish. I wonder if we could begin to think of ourselves more like that, like the children of God, those who stand to inherit His kingdom. If we can come to Him with open hands and open arms, knowing that we can't buy our way into heaven, there is no way to earn our salvation. What if we trusted God to give us what we needed? What if we worked in His fields by day and put our feet under His table by night? Is this what life in the kingdom looks like? Is it that place where we know that as long as we are His, we will always have what we need? You know, people ask me sometimes about the kingdom. They say, you talk about it all the time. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Where is it? When is it coming? And I say this sometimes. It's simple. The kingdom of God is wherever God is king. And that can be anywhere. That could be in your own heart. Maybe today you could decide that you've had enough of trying to run your own life, watching everything fall to pieces. Maybe today, with a sigh, you could lay down the scepter and take off the crown. Maybe you could undo your royal robes and step down off the throne and let God sit there instead. Maybe you could hang up a sign on your heart that says, under new management. I believe that in that moment, God's kingdom will come. So may it be, and so may we pray. God, maybe we've made it too hard. Maybe like those chief priests and elders, we have turned a relationship with you into a religion of requirements and rewards. Maybe we need to go back to a simpler time when we could call you Father and trust you to give us whatever we need. Hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.